Hello there, friends and neighbors. Thanks so much for coming back to my channel. This is me, Stella Hendricks. And thank you, oh, I just said that. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. I am losing my mind. I've done a couple of videos today and apparently now I'm going crazy, but that's okay. So now we are gonna do part two of the Dorothy Stratton story from True Crime, Death and Celebrity. <clears throat> Oh yeah, I'm not reading through this whole thing. Obviously, I, I think I just have to make a disclaimer at first. Uh, I'm paraphrasing most of this. I'm reading excerpts from it. I'll be adding my own opinion and commentary. Uh, I am not reading the whole thing. Marilyn Grabowski, a Playboy vice president and West Coast photo editor, thought the Canadian beauty might very well be a contender for the 25th anniversary Playmate. According to one former centerfold, centerfold Grabowski, along with Hefner, was the creator of the modern Playmate. The look would satisfy the Playboy image for the men and make it so that the women didn't go nuts. Grabowski set up a wonderful safe place in which to take your clothes off and get photographed. The former Playmate continued, surrounded by a really bright light, real, by really bright, really interesting women. Looking at Dorothy's pictures, the empathetic director had immediate had immediately discerned the rare, deeper beauty that lay behind the pretty Dutch face. Uh, Dorothy's mother and father were immigrants from the Netherlands. That Sunday morning, Grabowski and Dorothy arrived simultaneously at the Playboy building on Sunset Boulevard. Dorothy was breathless from her first remembered flight in an airplane from being met by the Playboy limousine, from being suddenly swept away into Hollywood, but she tried to conceal it. Dorothy was very blonde and very tall, Krabowski recalled of that first encounter. She wore a simple but quite smashing black jumpsuit. My first impression, as she got out of the limousine, was that this was not an unusual experience for her. As I walked up to her and introduced myself, I realized I was wrong. I remember thinking, here is a very young woman playing grown up. Her vulnerability draws an immediate protective response from me. The two were joined in Grabowski's office by Mario Caselli, a fatherly veteran of centerfold photography. After a half hour meeting, Caselli drove Dorothy to his Glendale studio and began to make this shy young woman famous. She enjoyed it as a kid would enjoy a new experience, he remembered years later. It was that kind of enjoyment it wasn't anything other than except that she was having fun. Now, of course, I know a lot more than I did then, but I think she was just so sheltered that this was like coming out of time, a coming out time for her, and she was excited about the idea of being in Playboy. Casilli found his new subject strangely mature, but also childlike. Now, oh, this is a picture of the mansion. She handled herself well with people, but there were things that would happen during a shooting or doing, during a conversation that made you realize that she was still a child. Uh, early Monday morning, Dorothy awoke to the cheerful clamor of her housemates who roamed the guest quarters naked. The newcomer demurely put on a robe. At breakfast, it took her a while to work up the courage to ask the butler for something to eat. The rest of the day was spent posing for Casilli's camera, but these shoots were only preliminary. Principal photography for the magazine would take at least two weeks. She'd be needed back in Los Angeles. For Snively, the two days Dorothy was gone had been a nightmare. He could not conceal his envy of her experience. For the next three weeks, Dorothy lived at the Playboy Mansion in Holmby Hills working with Mario Casilli on her photographs. The shoots went well, but the centerfold, which was shot on a large format 8 by 10 inch view camera, was taking longer than the model had expected. The Playboy little limo would bring her home to the mansion after a day under Casilli's lights, and she would usually eat and go to bed, although now and then she mingled with the guests who roamed the place at all hours. She attended the customary Friday and Sunday buffets and movies she danced her some of the nights away, 
but mainly hers was a quiet, hardworking life. Dorothy was changing, however. With Cassilli especially, she'd become bolder and more open, quick to laugh. Even when the word made her tired and cranky, she behaved like a trooper. Dorothy was never late, Cassilli said admiringly. She was very punctual, punctual and very professional for a girl who had never been involved in anything like that. I was quite impressed. In late August 1978, brought, brought, late 1978 brought a pivotal event. Playboy threw a huge slumber party to which hundreds came wearing pajamas and robes. Dorothy danced and drank and played the night away. She woke up the next morning with a crashing hangover and the certain knowledge that her life had begun to slide. When Snively made his mid-morning call, she told him how much she needed to see him. She picked him up at the airport late that afternoon and they spent the weekend together in a hotel. I often think about that. I wonder what happened exactly that at that time. I wonder if that's when she had had sex with Hugh Hefner in the jacuzzi and maybe afterwards she felt bad about it. I don't believe that she was violently raped. I think that she could have been like coerced, but also I feel like Snyder would have been encouraging her to do that. But it's, it's, it's complicated. Oh no, I said his name. I'm not supposed to say his name. His name was Snively. I forgot. I changed his name. Fuck him. Okay. Uh, word came in mid-September. From thousands of contestants, it had come down to two women, Dorothy and Candy Loving, an 18, one an 18-year-old Canadian with little experience of the world, and the other a senior in public relations at the University of Oklahoma. The title went to Loving. But Dorothy would be Miss August, 1979, which brought with it a $10,000 fee, and she had an excellent crack at the 1980 Playmate of the Year title. As her mother had shortened her first name to Nellie years before, Dorothy altered her surname. Her star would rise as Dorothy Stratton. Yeah, her real last name was uh, Hoag Stratton, uh, Dutch last name, of course, uh, but a little long and ungainly, you know, for these like star positions, a lot of people take on Hollywood names. Yeah, tons of this story is about Snively, who is like by far the least interesting part of this story to me. So I have to skip over like huge parts of stories about Snively. Who cares about you? Not me. Dorothy had a star quality that evoked the late Marilyn Monroe, an honest innocence radiated from her and she was trusting as a child. A fashion standout among Vancouver pimps, Snively was a sleazy embarrassment in Holmby Hills. Dorothy took her garish consort to the mansion's Halloween party that year. She was costumed as an angel in white satin. Snyder wore his former Hornby Street uniform, a broad brimmed hat and fur coat. He went as a pimp. When Hifner later said, said as much to Stratton, she laughed it off. It had been a disguise, she protested, not the real Snively. Although Dorothy was not aware of it yet, Snively was not the only important man in her life. A few days before the Halloween party, she'd met noted film director Peter, just back from location in Singapore and coming off a highly publicized eight-year relationship with actress Sybil Shepherd. I also have to think of a new name for him because I also hate him. We'll just call him Pete for now. Uh, with actress Sybil Shepherd. He was at loose ends and inclined to run with the pack at the mansion. Evidently taken by Dorothy's stunning beauty, Pete had signaled his interest in what he later called the oldest line in the world. He was putting together a new film. Would you like to read for the part? Stratton didn't call. Okay, yeah, that's also interesting because he loves to play Mr. Perfect Man later. He's such an egomaniac. But uh, the playmates at the mansion who knew Dorothy, who were friends with her, they would talk about what a bad reputation he had, and they told Dorothy not to call him. So he loves to pretend that he was only up there for a minute because he never, he never went to those kinds of parties. <laughs> He's such a liar, first of all, and like he had a bad reputation. The girls up there didn't even like him. They thought he was a jerk. 
In November, Dorothy accepted a part-time job as a door bunny at the Century City Playboy Club, spending most of her evenings in a rabbit-eared, fluffy-tailed costume cut low on the front and high in the rear. I love those bunny suits. I love, I would die to wear a bunny suit. The couple met a young woman in acting school, Molly Bassler. Later, Snively told Bassler he'd picked her out to be Dorothy's friend. That's how controlling he was, she said. Snively and Dorothy were both desperate in a way. Yes, they paint her as beautiful, nice, and so on, but she was desperate and clinging to something. During these months, Dorothy Stratton to keep their new life going. By day, she went out on auditions. By night, she put on her bunny costume and greeted custom customers at the Playboy Club, returning late. Snively, too, was busy. He brought his newest brainstorm, male strippers, Chippendales. He was having a local photographer named William Lachasse shoot some of his dancers with a view of placing the young men in a playgirl center centerfold. Okay, I really feel like Snively had that weird, like super intense, like vagina envy because he wanted to attract the same kind of sexual admiration and attention that Dorothy did. I think a lot of men feel this way towards women. They're very envious about that attraction that they so easily, you know, that men want them so badly and these women aren't even trying. Whereas these creepy guys, they try so hard and nobody looks at them twice. Like honestly, even the sexiest guy has so much more difficulty getting sexual partners than any woman, any woman would. So he, I think, is obsessed with Dorothy to the point that he's not only in love with her, but he also like wants to be her. I mean like um, Selena Quintanilla uh, level, what was that name of that crazy lady who killed her, who was obsessed with her. Oh, I can't think of it now because right now, of course, I'm on the spot. But how, the, how that lady, she was obsessed with Selena and I think she did have like actual like romantic weird love for her, but not real love, like caring love, just like this obsession and they want to be you even. I think that 100% Snively wanted to be Dorothy Stratton to the point that even with these male strippers who he wants to get into Playgirl, they're wearing the cuffs and collars like Dorothy Stratton was wearing as a bunny at the club. I have this image in my head of creepy ass Paul going into the bathroom one night after Dorothy comes back from, you know, working really hard and he's in there and he's like smelling her brushes and like brushing his hair with her brushes and the creepy stuff that like stalkers do. And he's in there and he's like putting on her cuffs and collars and he's like, why can't I be like her? What a weirdo! I tell you, I swear to God, I think it happened. I think it's completely true. This is something, I imagine, this is something I think is true though. Okay, anyway. <sighs> was busy in the Playgirl Central. At first, Molly was not sure what to make of him. I knew he was kind of slimy and weird. I never thought they seemed in love, she said. She wouldn't really say, oh, I've got to get away from Snively. She would just say, oh, let's go up to the mansion and swim and goof around. Yeah, it sounds like it was a really good escape for her to be able to go up to the mansion. Also, that from coming from someone else, if she felt that she was being attacked at the mansion or something, this is why I kind of doubt these stories, she wouldn't have said that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of opinion here. A lot of opinion. <laughs> that summer should have evaporated any tensions for there was a sharp smell of success in the smoggy Los Angeles air. For Dorothy, it came from the suddenly rising temp tempo of her new career. The Playboy promotional machinery was cranking up for her August centerfold, and she and Snively were working with LaShots on a Dorothy Stratton roller skating poster. Yeah, she does so much roller skating. She was in the uh, roller disco and pajama party. She roller skated in a marathon. And then she roller skates in, um, they all laughed. And she has this roller skating poster. Roller skating is such like a Dorothy Stratton thing. 
For Snively, success wore a different fragrance. Dorothy had agreed to marry him. Nobody thought much of this marriage idea. Molly believed that her friend's acquiescence reflected the low self-esteem of the chronic victim. To Dorothy's many protectors, it was as if a light had volunteered to be swallowed up by darkness. It was during a session that she blurted out the fact that she was going to get married, Mario Caselli recalled later. And I said, why would you want to do that? I didn't put the onus on him. It was more her age and things were happening, I said. Why don't you just wait a while? Dorothy told Marilyn Grabowski the good news at a health club called Ruffage, where they worked out from time to time. She told me she was thinking of marrying him, Grabowski recalls. She owed him. He had done a lot for her. I said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I would live with him. Don't marry him. I just think that so much is going to be offered to you and you're going to grow so much that this doesn't seem to be the best thing for you. Hugh Hefter was more succinct. Paul has the personality of a pimp. On June 1st, 1979, Snyder, I mean, uh, Snively and Stratton were married at the Silver Bell, Silver Bell Wedding Chapel in Las Vegas in a $65 ceremony. After a three-day honeymoon in a Vegas hotel, the couple returned to Los Angeles and a reception at Max Bayer's Nan Van Nuys residence. It was strange, remembered Molly. Paul was, I mean, oh my God, Snively was a strange guy. He was always sort of stiff and self-conscious and the party always felt that way. Only 1978 Playmate of the Year, Deborah Jo Fondren attended, attended from Playboy. David, I guess a brother of Snively was there, but no one came from the Stratton family. Not until weeks later was Dorothy able to tell her mother that she had married Snively. The tie that bound must have strangled something in Dorothy's feelings for her groom. After they got married, she couldn't sleep with him, revealed Molly. Obviously, she knew intuitively that something was wrong and she didn't love him. Increasingly, the dark side of their life intruded. As Dorothy's career accelerated, Molly and Snively found themselves often left alone together. Snively made occasional unsuccessful passes at her and suggested that she pose for Playboy so he could have the finder's fee. Once she provoked him enough to see a brief flash of the violence he kept pent up within him. Uh, I didn't agree with the whole Playboy scene, Molly said. I think it's degrading to women. And I started to verbalize that. Snively didn't like it and we got in an argument. Molly told, I mean, uh, Snively off in a rather gra in rather graphic terms. I'll never forget Dorothy's face. She turned totally white, and he said, "What did you say?" And I kept saying it. And then he came at me and kicked over the dish, the kitchen table. He literally freaked out because I showed disrespect, and I was terrified. He didn't touch me, but I knew that he could have. He could have been pushed over the edge, and that's when I chose. To leave. <sighs> Molly moved out that summer, but she remained close with Dorothy. She remembers talking with some other aspiring actresses about Dorothy, who had often accompanied them to Ruffage for a workout and to Nate's and Elle's afterwards for breakfast. It was so strange, she observed, describing the group's view of Dorothy. It was almost like she wasn't of this world in a weird way. I always look at them sort of as a metaphor, like Snively was evil and Dorothy was good, and they were put on this earth to fight it out, and no one won. Fascinating, very fascinating uh, story. I absolutely love it. And uh, that is gonna be part two. We're gonna keep this at 15 to 20 minute increments. And I am very excited to dive into the rest of that story. I think it gives really great details about uh, Dorothy's life that I have not been able to find from any other source. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much. And I will see you uh, guys on the flip side uh, when we get back with uh, part three. Thanks very much. Don't do anything I wouldn't do.